I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. This is Democracy Now! Well, 12 Democratic presidential hopefuls will spar this evening at Audubon University in Westerville, Ohio, during the fourth official Democratic primary debate. As voters weigh their options, one of the pressing issues on many Americans' minds is housing. Independent Senator Bernie Sanders of Vermont is the latest 2020 Democratic presidential candidate to release a comprehensive housing for all plan. He has advocated for rent control, called for big investments in affordable and, and subsidized housing, and has also pushed for reforms in zoning laws to allow construction in more expensive neighborhoods. Meanwhile, Massachusetts Senator Elizabeth Warren introduced the American Housing and Economic Mobility Act last year, which is the basis of her proposed affordable housing plan, calling for expanding fair housing legislation, building or rehabilitating millions of low- and middle-income housing units and reforming zoning laws. Several other candidates, including Senators Cory Booker and Kamala Harris, have released detailed plans to tackle the housing challenges of ordinary Americans, many who are still struggling after the devastating 2008 housing market collapse. When we spend the rest of the hour on a new book that looks at the devastating legacy of the foreclosure crisis and how much of the so-called recovery is a result of large private equity firms buying up hundreds of thousands of foreclosed homes, the book is by investigative reporter Aaron Glantz. It's called Home Wreckers, how a gang of Wall Street kingpins, hedge fund magnates, crooked banks and vulture capitalists suckered millions out of their homes and demolished the American dream. In it, Aaron Glantz reveals how the 2008 housing crash decimated millions of Americans family wealth, but enriched President Donald Trump's inner circle, including Trump cabinet members Steve Mnuchin and Wilbur Ross, Trump's longtime friend and confidant Tom Barrack, and billionaire Republican donor Steve Schwartzman. Aaron Glantz joins us now, senior reporter Reveal from the Center for Investigative Reporting, finalist for a Pulitzer Prize this year for his reporting on modern-day redlining. His new book, Home Wreckers, comes out today. It's great to have you with us, Aaron. What an amazing book. Just lay out what you found. Well, first of all, I wanted to know, 8 million Americans lost their homes in the Great Recession. But they didn't just disappear, right? So we live now in a society where the wealth gap between the richest one-tenth of 1 percent and the other 90 percent is bigger than it's been in 100 years. And so much of Americans' wealth is in their homes, because we have very few other ways to save. So I wanted to know uh, what happened to these houses, who profited off this mess. And that trail led me to a number of people who are in Donald Trump's inner circle. So talk about them and talk about how they benefited. Well, we start with the crash itself and the failure of the banks. When all of these bad loans came due and there was massive foreclosures, we, the taxpayers, the government, subsidized those foreclosures. And there were a lot of people who lost money during that time, but there were also people who bet on these failed banks and received government support to foreclose. And that included, as you mentioned, Steve Mnuchin who's now our Treasury secretary. He and his group of other investors, including George Soros, John Paulson, Michael Dell, the founder of Dell Computer, came in and bought IndyMac Bank, which was this form, uh, failed Pasadena, California bank, and then proceeded to foreclose on over 100,000 families, including 23,000 seniors. Now, under the deal that he made with the government to acquire this bank, which the government owned because it failed, he and his investors paid the government nothing. And then, although he invested some of his own money in the bank, we then paid him to subsidize his foreclosures. And uh, documents that I obtained under the Freedom of Information Act uh, show that we paid his group more than a billion dollars. And Wilbur Ross, the Commerce Secretary, had a similar deal at Bank United, which was another failed bank in Florida. And, of course, IndyMac, as, as you show in your book, was really the first major bank uh, to collapse, and then a whole bunch—a series of others happened uh, in 2008. And it was basically based on a, a lot of either fraudulent or predatory lending, if you could talk about that as well. There were a lot of 
predatory loans going around in the housing bubble. And at this point, we all know that. What I wanted to know was, when there were families who got these so-called ninja loans, right, no income, no job, no assets, no problem, or these loans that had these teaser rates and then reset at a higher level, and you were told, oh, you can just refinance, or the main character in my book, Sandy Jolly, who's family owned their home outside of Los Angeles for more than 30 years until they got a reverse mortgage that sapped their equity. Um, and all of these families lost their homes to foreclosure. What I wanted to know was what happened after. Right? We've been stuck in this country on this trauma of 2007, 2008, 2009. But now here we are in 2019. Ten years have passed. The unemployment rate is low. The president tells us everything is great, but people don't feel like everything is great. So, you know, we have jobs, but what happened to our wealth? They took it. That's what happened. And also the, uh, the disproportionate impact that this loss of equity in all these homes had, especially on the African-American and Latino communities, which were even more dependent on home equity for the, what little wealth they had net, or net wealth they had. What we see is that banks like Steve Mnuchin's bank concentrated their foreclosures in communities of color. And then, when they started making loans again, when the economy improved, they didn't make loans to those communities. So they wiped out the wealth of these communities with foreclosure. But then, over a five-year period, Steve Mnuchin's bank made three loans to help African Americans buy homes, and 11 loans. This is a national bank, helped three African Americans and 11 Latinos buy homes over five years. And now, Steve Mnuchin, as the Treasury Secretary, is in, charging, in charge of regulating every American bank. And so he and Donald Trump picked one of his deputies at One West Bank, Joseph Odding, for this position called Comptroller of the Currency, which basically is America's top bank cop, who's in charge of enforcing laws like the Community Reinvestment Act that are meant to stop redlining. So this bank, um, which didn't make any loans, hardly any, to communities of color, is now in charge, you know, its leadership under President Trump, of making sure that these anti-redlining laws are followed. And it's, it's, it seems to me it's not just the Trump administration, because it was under the Obama administration that were supposed to be some efforts to help homeowners stay in their homes. And, in fact, Julian Castro, now a presidential candidate, was at HUD supposedly in charge of the efforts to uh, assist homeowners. And that's come under heavy criticism, what, was, what the Obama administration did to help these homeowners. This book, you know, some people say it's an anti-Trump book, because it has Donald Trump on the cover holding wads of cash, with Steve Mnuchin riding on a wrecking ball and, you know, Wilbur Ross pulling money out of a house. But all of this activity happened, as you mentioned, when Barack Obama was the president. The homeownership rate in America, this is what got me started on this book. I started working on this book. It's an investigative book. It took years to write. I started working on it in 2016, when I didn't know who the new president was going to be. But I noticed that the homeownership rate in this country Instead of going up during the economic recovery, it kept going down. It went down in 2012, it went down in 2013, 14, 15, and 16. Until 2016, it bottomed out at its lowest rate in over 50 years. And so that's when I started asking the question, who profited under Obama? Tell us more about Tom Barrack and Steve Schwartzman so, and their relationship with Trump and what they did. So, Tom Barrack is Donald Trump's oldest friend, closest friend, introduced Ivanka at the Republican National Convention, planned the inauguration for Donald Trump. Steve Schwartzman, another old Trump friend, uh, according to media reports, still has the president on speed dial. Now, we've been talking about the foreclosures. Who um, bought? those foreclosures. We have seen a massive transfer of wealth, as I mentioned, not from, you know, one group of families who got foreclosed to another group of families who were able to buy homes, but we now have three million homes in this country that are owned by LLC, LP, and LLP shell companies. And some of the largest buyers of these homes were these private equity funds run by Tom Barrick and Steve Schwartzman. So there's now a company called Invitation Homes, which was founded by Blackstone, Steve Schwartzman's company, owns 80,000 homes across more than a dozen states. And it's a 
private, it's a publicly traded company now that they had their IPO. So you can track, they track very clearly their rent increases, the relatively small amount of money they spend on maintenance, and also importantly, because these people are leveraged buyout kings, they have been taking these homes and bundling them into this new type of mortgage-backed security, taking on a ton of debt. So, for example, I mentioned earlier Sandy Jolly, this uh, longtime homeowner in Los Angeles area whose family owned their home for more than 30 years before they were foreclosed on by Steve Mnuchin's bank. Now that home is part of a $960 million mortgage-backed security bundled with thousands of other homes. So if you go and look at the property record, you don't see like a $20,000 home equity line of credit to remodel the kitchen. You see a $960 million lien on the house taken out by a private equity firm. Our guest, Aaron Glantz, senior reporter Reveal from the Center for Investigative Reporting, his new book, Home Wreckers, How a Gang of Wall Street Kingpins, Hedge Fund Magnates, Crooked Banks and Vulture Capitalists Suckered Millions Out of Their Homes and Demolished the American Dream. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez. Uh, Aaron, talk to us about John Paulson, another billionaire uh, uh, hedge fund and uh, equity guy, uh, who uh, another big supporter and advisor of, of, of Donald Trump, and his role in all of this. Well, you know, Steve Mnuchin, we've been talking about Steve Mnuchin, the Treasury Secretary, and how he bought this bank, IndyMac. But he was just the head of a group that bought this bank. So Paulson— He didn't have the real money. He had, he had some money, but not the big money. Yeah, I money. mean, he lives in a 6,000-square-foot <laughs> apartment on Park Avenue and has another house in Bel Air and another one in Scotland. But that's not the real money, right? <laughs> I mean, Paulson had made billions of dollars in the run-up to the housing bust. He was one of these hedge fund guys who saw that we were in a bubble, bet against the American dream, and made a ton of money. And then, then he's like, OK, now there's a crash. How am I going to make money on the way up again? And so his staff uh, studied the SNL bailout. All of these guys, all of these guys looked at this uh, savings and loan crisis in the late 80s, which is another time where the government intervened and bailed out the rich at the expense of the rest of us. And they used it as a playbook. And so one of the things they noticed was that some of the richest deals, the best deals for the hedge fund guys to come out of the SNL crisis came at the very beginning. And that's why they— um, that's why they bet on IndyMac. But what's interesting is Mnuchin, another reason he had to put together this group, is if any of these hedge funds had put in more than a certain amount of money into the bank in terms of their share of ownership, they would be regulated as bank holding companies, and the government would be able to go in and look at their books. So they all just stayed just a little bit below that threshold to make sure that they would avoid scrutiny. So the debate is tonight, Aaron Glantz, uh, the housing policies of the different Democratic presidential candidates. Well, first of all, I would love to hear them talk about it in tonight's debate. I mean, the moderators have totally abdicated on asking about issues of economic equity. So, as you mentioned earlier, Elizabeth Warren has a plan, Bernie Sanders has a plan, uh, Pete Buttigieg has a plan, Kamala Harris has a plan. Uh, I'm not sure if I've heard one from uh, Vice President Biden. Uh, but I would like to see them engage, you know, on these issues. You know, Kamala Harris says she wants to put— uh, $100 billion towards promoting African-American home ownership. The black home ownership rate in this country is below the level that it was at uh, when segregation and discrimination was legal. Um, I'd like to hear her talk to Elizabeth Warren, who has a plan to give massive down payment assistance and rectify uh, redlining. Or Juan was talking about Bernie Sanders' plan on rent control and affordable housing. I mean, this is something where the Democratic candidates should engage in the same way they've been engaging on health care and present their conflicting visions and debate. Um, you know, as I mentioned at the outset, the, um, the richest 0.1 of 1 percent of the American people have the same amount of wealth as the other 90 percent. And that is because, in America, 80 percent of most middle-class families' wealth goes to only five things — food, housing, shelter, transportation, health care. All those other things, besides housing, just disappear as soon as you spend your money. Housing is the only way that most Americans have to save. The average American family has $4,000 in the bank. So either you put your money in equity in your house, or you pay it to your landlord, and if it's a private equity firm, it goes on the bond market. Or, or you have a little bit for yourself. And I, I'd like to see the, the candidates engage on this question. 
And in terms of uh, your book also does talk about some of the regulators who attempted to to do the best they could to deal with the bank failures. Uh, Sheila Bear, of course, is, is uh, highlighted in your book. Talk about the, the regulatory climate right now in terms of being able to protect uh, homeowners and the, the, uh, the, the lending industry in general. Well, I think, actually, when I looked at the history of America, the thing that jumped out to me was in this financial crisis, how many people came throughout the whole process with really great ideas that were summarily ignored, you know, under President Obama. I write about Alan Blinder, who was a former uh, member of the Federal Reserve Board, who in 2008 went with a number of other prominent economists, including members of the Conservative Enterprise Institute, and said, hey, you know what we need is a government-run bank, like President Roosevelt had during the Great Depression, which the Homeowners Loan Corporation helped uh, more than a million Americans keep their homes. It refinanced one out of every five mortgages in urban America. It invented the long-term fixed-rate mortgage. And guess what? It made money for the taxpayers, because the American people paid their loans back. After World War II, we had the GI Bill. It helped four million Americans buy homes. It basically broke even, because the GIs paid their loans back. Instead, what we had over the past decade is this massive government giveaway to private equity and a few people who are now close friends of the president and in his administration. The really scary thing is that under President Trump, these people are running the country. And so they are bit by bit taking away the few scraps and reforms that Obama put in place, defanging the Consumer Financial Protection Bureau, uh, weakening the Dodd-Frank Act, which regulated the banks. Uh, we're seeing, as I mentioned earlier, a ballooning number of this new kinds of mortgage-backed security, uh, $960 million lien on a single house in South Los Angeles. So, so this is where we're at. You know, the people who looted us during the Obama years are now running the country, and that's why the book is called Homewreckers. We've got just 30 seconds. Um, what shocked you most? I think the thing that shocked me most was how many of these good ideas were proposed and how much they were ignored over more than 10 years, and that there really is no reason that we have to be in the situation we are now. Well, I want to thank you so much, Aaron, for being with us. We're going to do part two, and we'll put it online at democracynow.org. Aaron Glantz, senior reporter, reveal from the Center for Investigative Reporting, his new book, Home Wreckers, How a Gang of Wall Street Kingpins, Hedge Fund Magnates, Crooked Banks and Vulture Capitalists Suckered Millions Out of Their Homes and Demolished the American Dream. That does it for our show. Happy birthday, Juan Gonzalez. Happy birthday. Thank you, Amy. We're getting old, aren't we, Amy? <laughs> getting older well, than we, we also thought. have someone else to say happy birthday to. Happy birthday to Miguel Nagara, our engineer. And congratulations to our producer, Tammy Warrenoff, and her husband, Dave Rowley, on the birth of their son, Quentin Akira Warrenoff Rowley. Welcome to the world, Q. And that does it for our show. Go to our website at democracynow.org um, for all of our podcasts. Podcasts. I'm Amy Goodman with Juan Gonzalez, the birthday boy. Thanks so much for joining us. Make a wish, Juan.